Alabama State versus Southern was one of the biggest games of the weekend. And Sports Illustrated's Mason Smith joins the show to break down not only D. Davis, but also Harold Blood and the defenses for both teams. Oh, yeah, it's Locked On HBCU. Play my music. You are Locked On HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. family welcome back to another episode of the locked on hbcu podcast your number one daily one-stop shop for everything hbcu athletics monday through friday part of the locked on podcast network your team every day and i of course am darian gray aka the mouth of the south texas southern alum and former tsu herald sports editor and current contributing writer at usa today's saints wire Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day, every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S, ends with an S. And also we have a stacked episode today that starts and finishes with Alabama State versus Southern we have Mason Smith from Sports Illustrated, a friend of the show, joining because he was live on hand for one of the biggest games of week one. We break down the biggest questions, which is D. Davis, Harold Blood. But then also, was it more offense or defense? We start off with the ASU quarterback. We have Mason Smith of Sports Illustrated here with me. And Mason, the biggest story around Alabama State's offense and kind of the Alabama State team in general this offseason What's D. Davis? Everybody wanted to know, was he going to be the starting quarterback? Was it going to be Damon Stewart? They had a battle that came down to the wire. Let's take it back before the season even started. What do you think went into making the decision to retain D. Davis as the starting quarterback for the Hornets? I think the biggest decision that went into retaining D. Davis is the fact that it was the second year in the system. I think Eddie Robinson really highlighted that as far as why Davis had the inside track, you know, the week before the first game. Uh, even though we didn't look the greatest in that scrimmage that I did attend, I can I can understand the logic behind that. You know, as you're trying to groom an offense or prepare an offense for the strength of your quarterback, because yes, D. Davis has a lot of strengths, and his weaknesses are in a lot of areas that are untraditional to quarterbacks, which is passing, and that's fine. But it's going to be a matter of okay, what can we do to maximize this guy's talent? Because we know he's talented. You know, for those who have followed him in the Texas area, went to North Shore High School, they've seen how talented he was coming out of North Shore. And right now it's about pulling that talent out of him on the collegiate level. And I would ask, so after week one, because this is going to be under a microscope, like this isn't just going to go away. Did you feel like he justified that decision with the way that he played against Southern? Yes, I did. And the main reason I would start with that is because he won. Like, I think we have to consider that. How you win, we can, we're going to get into that in just a second. But of course, when you win, you know, he's 1-0 right now in terms of the 2023 season as a second-year starter. That has to account for something in terms of his personal growth as a quarterback. Now, to be more detailed about his play, they did make the offense more suited to him. Now, when we see the scrimmage, it was a very similar to what I saw, you know, very run-heavy, run base. you know. It was some screens. It was some direct snaps to Jawan Howe. Now, what we saw in the scrimmage, a lot of that stuff went wrong. What we saw in the game, a lot of that stuff went right. And some days that may be the case. And I think it can be successful to an extent, you know, when you have a quarterback that is such a threat with his legs that when you incorporate screens, when you incorporate direct snaps, when you incorporate, you know, if he has a quick one, two second read in the pocket for a passing play and it's not there, he decides to run, then that can ultimately work in his favor. So I do like what I, I did like what I saw from D Davis week one against Southern. I think there was a lot to like about him. And he also made the throws when he needed to in the second half. So I think there is a justification for him to come back as a starter for this year. Well, when you talk about the passes and the, and the throws that he did make, I, I kind of have to ask because I did read your articles. I thought you had a really nice trio of articles about this game. It's on Sports Illustrated for those who haven't read them yet. Had one about the just the game in general, got more specific with the Alabama State defense, then also about Southern and what they felt like went wrong. And we'll dive into a lot of that on here. But in case you want to read his words, he's there. But that being said, 
one of the quotes was that coach Eddie Robinson is looking to limit the passes despite him having a nice and him being D Davis having a nice second half at moments and really taking advantage of the times when he needed to pass to make the right play. Why do you feel like coach Rob is still trying to limit him as a passer? I think it's pretty simple. When you know a quarterback is still developing that area of his game, you don't want that to be a reliable aspect of it. You just want him to be great at certain times. You know, we again, he said it, like I said in the story, if he was a linebacker going against D. Davis, or he was a D.C. coaching against him, he would tell his defense, let's keep him in the pocket. Let's make him a pocket passer. So obviously they want to counteract it by setting up to where he won't have to do that. He can use his legs. He's telling him, hey, if it's not there in the first couple of seconds, pull it down and run. And we saw how explosive he can be when he makes a quick decision. Now, I will give him credit with that. One thing he didn't really do in the scrimmage was the fact that he didn't make quick decisions to pull it down and run. He looked very chaotic and scrambly. This game or the game yesterday on Saturday, he looked very concerned. Okay, I'm pulling it down. And this is what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to go be that the athlete that I am. And that's what he did. But to your point, Darian, when he talked about the throws that he made, he made a really nice throw to Tyree Saunders. He made some really good throws to Keyshawn Johnson, who did amazing on Saturday. Shout out to him. It's just a matter about making the certain throws when you can. He talked about even David said it was a setup. Everything he did in the first was kind of a setup to where it opened up the passing game. That's probably a good way to think about it. When you set up, you know, very simple idea of offensive philosophy, run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. Now the defense is fully committed to the run, dump it in right over the top because they've now committed to the run. So I think that philosophy is going to help D Davis, you know, as the season progresses, but I do have a small concern about how it continues to grow down the line. Yeah. So for me, I do feel like it needs to grow. I do feel like you're going to need to expand the passing game. I don't think that the screens and, all of the, like, not even just short passes and quick passes, but short as in at the line of scrimmage, behind the line of scrimmage, slightly above the line uh, line of scrimmage. I think that's going to have to grow. But I'll say this. If D. Davis can do what he did today, which was orchestrate the offense well in the first half and then make throws when he needs to, how much does that level up Alabama State within the SWAC? Man, that that honestly changes the game for them because with Alabama State being picked third behind Jackson State, I mean, Florida A&M and Jackson State, you know, in that order, I think it really just elevates into a true third contender in that SWAC East. You know, you really didn't know what to expect from that offense. You know that Jawan Howe is going to be good, and he was good. I like what I saw from him. But it's going to ultimately depend on how effective that passing game was going to be. And as we've seen in the NFL, for the NFL fans that watch, you know, sometimes you don't need a otherworldly quarterback. You need a game manager. You know, someone's not going to turn the ball over. You know, someone's going to make smart decisions. And ultimately, besides a couple of sacks that he probably could have avoided, D. Davis played a smart game. He played a clean game. That's what they really need for him more than anything. They don't need him to throw for 250, 300 yards a game. That's really not what they want to do. They want to be a run-heavy team, you know, philosoph- philosophically anyway. But if he can make the throw, you know, a 20-yard throw, to Saunders, a 15-yard throw, 20-yard throw. You can just add those at specific spots to keep the defense honest. It will be fine. But to to your point, when I talk about growing, I think it's going to be important to see when you go against a a really strong defense, whether it's a Florida A&M, whether it's a Jackson State and Alcorn, you're going to have to be more cognizant of mixing it up because Southern took a while to catch on to those direct snaps and, you know, runs and extended runs. I'm still in your quote there with the extended runs. But the idea with that is, yeah, I, I, I like that. Extended runs is a really good word. But <laughs> when it, <laughs> I, I can't take credit. I got to gotta show love to my guy Ross, but I appreciate it nonetheless. I'll accept hey, the, the compliment for him like we had an awards show. Hey, man. Shout, shout out to Ross for that for that terminology. But I do think with a defense that can quick, quickly or quickly pick up on that, you know, run-based style, whether it's basic or trick, you're going to have to be quicker to go to your passing game. So it's going to have to be – relying on how fast D Davis can progress passing wise to complement the run throughout the year. Now I will say this. I believe that we need to give the Southern defense a little bit more praise because I don't feel as if the score and how we are speaking about D Davis exactly line up. And I think that Southern had a pretty good day on the defensive side of the ball. And I want to ask you some questions about that as we continue with locked on HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. And listen, when we're discussing D. Davis, he's going to be a pretty important part of Alabama State's path 
to the SWAC championship or the celebration bowl. He's going to be important for that. And similar to that, you need to have the right parts for your car. If you want to be able to get to the destination, you want to. Otherwise, halfway through your destination, you're going to be looking for help. But not when you go and get parts from eBay Motors, because if ever in that situation, all you have to do is go to ebaymotors.com and they have over 120 million parts. Once you put your car model, so just put, I don't know, a Dodge Challenger into the garage section, they'll give you only the parts that are made for you. Guaranteed fit, the right prices, everything is cheap low excuse me not cheap but low and affordable so let's go ahead and go to ebay motors just like you need the right parts for a team get the right right parts for your car as we continue rolling on today's episode of locked on hbcu i appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day don't forget this friday as will be the same with every single friday during the college football season we have locked on college football live from 10 a.m. to noon central time every Friday. If you missed it last week, that's OK. We'll be back again. I'll be on the show discussing the games of the week that are upcoming the same way that I did with last week. But right now I have Mason Smith here with me. And this is something that is a personal opinion of mine when looking at D Davis and, you know, we speak about the Alabama State offense and what they were able to do, but they didn't put many points on the board. So I feel like we have to give a little bit of credit. And I wasn't there. I wasn't able to see everything. But to me, Southern's defense played a pretty good game. You know, we can compliment D. Davis and the things that we were able to see. But they only scored 14 points. What was Southern doing right to maybe keep? I'll say that the Hornets out of the end zone, even if there was a little bit of movement of the ball at times. Absolutely. Now, to, to kind of preface it, there were four main things that Alabama State's offense included in that first half. Traditional runs, direct snaps to the running back, screen passes, or a very, very quick slant to a wide receiver or something of that nature. Those were the four things that comprised the Alabama State offense early on. Now, the biggest thing that helped them be successful is the fact that it was, it was still unique. How often do you really see a direct snap to the running back? How often do you see a screen and a traditional run or even if it's a pass play? The quarterback is still a threat to run in his own right. So that's what really kind of caught Southern off guard. What helped Southern defense catch up was the fact they eventually caught on to this scheme. They were becoming smarter football players and started saying, hey, if this is the setup they're going with, we've just seen this. Usually it's a screen pass. So either the outside backer or the cornerback on that side saw it and was able to predict it, saying, hey, they're doing this. Let me go ahead and attack. And sure enough, that's what they did. And also the defensive line in that front seven came to play. Because at the end of the day, if you stack a box against a run play and you know it's a run and it turns out to be a run, what are you going to do? You're going to get a tackle for loss. It's, it's eventually going to you know work itself out to where the scheme you know, can't match up because a running play can be stopped if you know it's coming. Just like a pass play can be stopped if you know it's coming. And that's what happened with Southern's defense. So it wasn't really a matter of brawn. It was definitely a matter of brains. When they picked it up, that's what helped them be successful. And listen, this was 14-10. So neither team really scored a bunch of points. And, you know, I, if you're rooting for Alabama State, I think that you should hope that your offense puts up a little bit more points so it doesn't feel like a recurrence of last season. But when you go 14-10, I have to ask you, does this mean that the defenses of Alabama State and Southern lived up to advertising? Or does it mean that the offenses of Southern and Alabama State weren't really firing on all cylinders? Well, I think with Southern, their offense was a little bit of a – a self-sabotage in a sense. I know that's kind of like the, the buzzword you want to use. That's the buzzword that, honestly, Harold Blood used when I talked to him after the game. He said that after the first quarter, and for those who didn't watch the game, Blood and the offense looked great. Blood looked as good as advertised, making throws all over the field, threaded the needle to Kendrick Browns on the back of the end zone for that first touchdown of the game. But eventually, they just kind of took their foot off the gas. I think the best way to describe it, they didn't kind of play with the same intensity, even though they still had some offensive success in the first half. Now, when the second half came, Alabama State's defense, after kind of playing a lot of days equal speed, all of a sudden decided to play, hey, we're going to play up to our standard. We're going to play up to our potential and actually fly around the field and get deflections and ultimately two interceptions, which is what they got, and two forced fumbles and recoveries, which is what they got. So I think with Southern, there was a little bit of both. But with Alabama State, it's a little bit of both, but in a different sense. The defense was really solid for Southern. But we already knew that Alabama State's offense was a little bit, you know, questionable in terms of its firepower. We, now, Keyshawn Johnson is solid. Jawan Howell is really good. 
you know, Jalen Sultan, the backup running back or the RB2, was really good as well. And of course, D Davis did what he did. But we're seeing that a low scoring run, pound the ball kind of team, that's a slow moving offense. That's not an offense really built to put up a lot of points. They're going to rely on their defense. That's something I expected. And for those who have talked to me, I've said this game's going to be a low scoring game, about 14 to 9, 14 to 10, because it's going to be ugly. It's going to be a matter of them competing and a matter of who can kind of win this war of attrition between two swag schools. So when you're looking at Harold Blood, like because you know, when we discuss things like energy, and we'll speak on this as well when it comes to Alabama State, when you look at Harold Blood, how do you go from being on all cylinders to throwing two interceptions? It's more than just energy, I would assume. You're right. It go it eventually goes back to what the offense did not do. No credit to Alabama State. We're going to talk about that in a second. Did a whole bunch of things right. But if the offense is not really keeping their foot on the gas and maximizing their, you know, their play potential like they did in the first half, ultimately that's going to lead, you know, to issues. And of course, as time ticks on, you know, they score, the, all, the opposing team's offense starts to develop rhythm. You know, rhythm in some senses is finite. The more an off, the opposing offense is in rhythm, the less you are trying to, you know, feel the pressure and compete and, you know, maintain that, you know, that energy. Now, keep in mind, this is Harold Blood's first start as the starter after replacing two quarterbacks that both did well in their own right last year for the Jaguars. And I think ultimately he did well, and I think he'll continue to be well as the season progresses. But the offense didn't really, you know, live up to expectations. Gary Quarles had an okay performance, not great. And then Harold Blood obviously looked like a world beater but then more than came back down to earth in the third and fourth quarters. And those aren't isolated. They're not practicing and playing on air. They're playing against Alabama State's defense. And I want to highlight them because I feel like this is what really won the game for Alabama State in week one and one of the games that I thought was a must-watch 60 minutes over the weekend. And we'll break that down as we continue with Locked On HBCU. And that's wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU. I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day. Every day, making it all the way to segment three. And I thank you two times for that. I have Mason Smith of Sports Illustrated here with me. He was live at the Alabama State versus Southern game on Saturday. And for me, Alabama State's defense was on fire. I thought for the majority of the game, you take out the first quarter, I thought they were dominant. In the first quarter, Southern scored both of their possessions. A touchdown and a field goal gave them 10 points, and they didn't score another point for the rest of the game. And for me, what adjustments, because, you know, we spoke about energy. For me, I'm looking for what adjustments that Alabama State made on the defense that was able to stop Southern. We talked about how Alabama State's offense made an adjustment in terms of its tactics. For the defense, it was a matter of tenacity. When you don't play up to your speed, your potential, your aggressiveness, you're kind of allowing the other offense to settle in and execute and do what they want to do, which is exactly what happened with Southern. Now, Southern had its own faults as well. There were a lot of things that they didn't do right. But when Alabama State finally decided to play up to their potential, because remember, we've got this point of defense as top three in the SWAC for sure. Everybody feels like this defense was strong, but they didn't really play like that because wait a minute. Harold Blood is, is slicing up this Hornets secondary with Jacoby Robinson and Adrian Maddox, these all swat guys. Like, no, they eventually started to play up to their to their style. And that's one thing that Jawan Howe said about the defense in the postgame press conference, saying the defense told him, hey, man, we see y'all out there. You know, we, we got y'all. The offense moving the ball. We going to get right too." And eventually they did. They eventually continued to apply the pressure. A great first pick, um, but his, his name escapes me, but I know the second pick was by Michael Victor, which ultimately sealed the game. Literally, as we're walking down to the, to the press conference room to get ready, we're hearing the crowd go crazy because Michael Victor had the game-sealing interception. On top of that, especially right off the red zone, that's when Alabama State forced the fumble and they recovered it to you know, stop that drive, which I think is really impressive. And now the defense – ultimately became as good as advertised. Now, one thing I'm concerned about, how are they going to start in future games? You can't really do that against everybody. What they go against FAMU, which I'm pretty sure is on the schedule, and they're going to see a high-octane offense that can score a bunch of points. You can't start slow. When you start slow against high-powered offenses, that's going to set you up for a much bigger hole to climb out of. And 
I thought that was an interesting note. And that was from one of the articles. Once again, go read Mason's work on Sports Illustrated, especially if you want to know about this game. He had three articles on this. I don't know if that's going to be the regular on the games that you attend to drop three articles on it, but we did appreciate it nonetheless. For me, the, the turnovers that you that you mentioned, the interceptions, the fumbles, that was the defining aspect of this game, right? So I think I probably, maybe it's because I wasn't there, but I think that I hold Alabama State's defensive performance in a little bit more higher light than you do. Um, because to me, I'm like, man, they were dominant for three quarters. Like they the first two drives, yeah, they scored, but they were dominant for three quarters. And that's my perspective as somebody who wasn't in the stadium, got to see all the angles and whatnot. Um, but of all the things that I loved by them, to not carry on too much, we have you on here to talk about it. But of all the things I loved about them. It was their ability to force turnovers and turnovers. And I felt like that was the defining aspect of the game. Do you agree with that? And if not, what was the defining aspect of the game for you? I'll say it's one of two defining aspects. Number one, for sure, the defense. The defense was 100 percent why this team is going to be good and why this team may be successful in the SWAC East and maybe even the SWAC overall. The second defining moment that we've talked about throughout the course of this show D. Davis making throws when it counted. When you can, if he can do that, this team is a whole lot better. Their potential just rose exponentially. I didn't really think that D. Davis was going to be that caliber of a of a passer that he that he showed me. But and yes, we could talk about the simplicity of it. The passes may be simple in the grand scheme of things. You know, you set him up with the run, drop back plenty of time, hit the over receiver twenty yards downfield. You and I have seen on film or on clips that there were cases where it was that same scenario and he did not make that pass. But the fact that he was able to make those passes during the game is a good sign for this offense. He just has to be a good enough passer to keep the defense honest. If he can do so, man, I would really be concerned about whoever's going to play Alabama State. Unless they can really make Davis, you know, throw 25, 30 passes or more a game. You know, this offense is actually nothing to snuff at. I'm excited to see what they do going forward. And you mentioned offense. I, I, I'll go into it one more time. Keyshawn uh, Johnson. He had a great game, you know, a really good game. He led the team in in receptions and in, in yardage last year. So I don't know if breakout is the right word to say, but it kind of feels it kind of feels appropriate in a sense. So I'll say it anyway. Do you think that this could be a breakout season for a player who was compared to Jerry Rice and his work ethic? I think it may be a good chance, Darren. I really think so. And for those who don't know, Coach Eddie Robinson said Keyshawn Johnson, who finished with, I think, 107 yards and two touchdowns with nine catches. He said Johnson had a Jerry Rice-like work ethic. And of course, you know how great Jerry Rice is, being a Mississippi Valley State grad. Shout out to the HBCU legends. But the idea of him having a breakout year, I think, is a very real. I ain't, go to, I ain't go to Mississippi Valley State. I'm talking. I'm talking about Jerry Rice going to Mississippi Valley State. Oh, I thought you said you knew how. I, how, I thought you said me being a Mississippi Valley oh, State uh, man, grad. What? I understood. Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor. No, no. Nah, look, bro. I was confused. I had to get that. <laughs> I had to get it straight. I, carry on. I, I misheard you. I misheard you. But I, I was raggy. Uh no, no, so go ahead, continue. No, I un I understand, but all all jokes aside, I think you have, you're very right to feel like it could be a, a breakout year. Why? The first game of the year, regardless if you're a freshman or a fifth year senior, it's a first impression of what you worked on all summer. You're expected to improve from what you did the previous year, and that's exactly what Keyshawn Johnson did. He's established himself as you know a wide receiver one for this team. And if he continues on the pace that he's on now, I'm not really I'm not really ready to crown him just yet in terms of an all swack receiver. I think there are some receivers that are still better than him so far in this conference. But if he continues to progress, 100 yard performances, multi touchdown performances, he can earn his way into one of the upper echelon of receivers in the SWAC, maybe earn one of those four spots on the all SWAC teams. But I do think, yes, Keyshawn Johnson is poised to have an all breakout year. Well, I appreciate you, Mason. Anytime you had a game, you know, I always hit you up. Let's talk about it. Let's get into it, especially if it's a game with as much prominence as this. This was a game that I was looking forward to for weeks once I saw it was on the week one slate. So I appreciate you coming on. You can check out Mason's work. And I'm going to say it three times because it really was incredible. I really did enjoy him. And specifically the, the second one, 
I don't remember the title of the second one, but it was the second Alabama State um, piece you put out, and it was the one where they discussed the offense really firing up the defense. I thought that was your best article. I really enjoyed it. But you guys go check it out and, uh, and follow Mason on Twitter at Mason T underscore Smith, and you can continue checking us out every single day. I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day. We'll be back tomorrow. We're doing this one early, so I don't exactly know what we're going to talk about. That's two days in advance, but I appreciate you for checking it out nonetheless. And in the meantime, in between time, until next time that we hear each other, family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.